welcome to Baseball Seasons 1959. Something to prove. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! President Eisenhower gives the pastime its send-off, interrupting a golf vacation to throw out the first ball. It was the final year of the Halcyon 50s, a decade of remarkable stability, and in some ways, baseball reflected that. Since 1901, baseball had been comprised of two eight-team leagues, and 1959 was no different. And in the American League, it truly seemed that each season ended in the same way, with a New York Yankees celebration. The Bombers did it again. They made baseball history. And in 1959, the Yankees were looking to make it 10 pennants in 11 years. Their main competition going into the season would be the Chicago White Sox, a team that had been trying to take them down for almost a decade. Oh, there's a big rivalry, but we always came in second best. I mean, the Yankees, let's face it, they had a great ball team. In the National League, the Milwaukee Braves had won two straight pennants. They had beaten the Yankees in the World Series in 1957 and lost to them in 1958 and baseball fans could realistically expect to see a World Series sequel of the Yankees and Braves again in 1959. But as much as America enjoyed the seeming calm of the 50s, it was still locked in a long and torturous struggle with integration. The moment a Negro child walks into the school, every decent, self-respecting, loving parent should take his white child out of that parochial school. But for baseball, change had come early. Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier in 1947. And by 1959, the complexion of the game had been dramatically altered with the influx of many gifted African-American players. And when Pumsey Green joined the Red Sox for the 59 season, they became the final team to integrate. I think it was difficult for Pumsey, but he was a little bit like Jackie Robinson. He had the type of personality uh, that would allow him to, to withstand some of the criticism. Jackie had set the model for all African-American players that would follow him. From the moment Dodger executive branch Ricky had brought him to Brooklyn, his challenge was clear. I remember Mr. Ricky talked mainly about all the people who were gonna be anti. He said, we're gonna have some people on our side, but we really are not gonna have very many allies. And you've got to turn your cheek at every opportunity. You wanna know whether I can do it. I saw what Jackie went through and it was just amazing. Uh, you had to be there to, just to see what all the things that he went through. pride in things, but that were, they were degrading and they hurt a great deal. Jackie was known as a fiery competitor, but he managed to hold his temper in check, understanding the magnitude of what was at stake. Jackie realized that he wasn't taking all these hits for himself. He was doing it for the rest of the guys that was going to come behind him. Jackie would win Rookie of the Year honors and make a strong statement for the equality of African-American players that would speak boldly to the next generation. Knowing that a black man was playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers, for some reason I just felt like I don't have to stay in these projects all my life. I, I, can, I can do something, I can go somewhere. Maybe I could be somebody. I was always say, what happened to our people? Why can't we have somebody that I can really look up to. Then when Jackie came in in 47, I said to myself, boy, I got a chance to, you know, get to the majors. I don't know how I'm gonna get there, but I have a chance to do that. With Jackie offering them hope, a bevy of talented African-American players made their way to the majors. The majority of these young stars would follow Jackie to the National League, giving it a huge advantage. There were so many good black ball players, and the National League was way ahead of the American League about getting the black ball player. Ernie Banks, Willie Mays, Frank Robinson, Hank Aaron, and Jackie's teammate Roy Campanella, these transcendent players would come to dominate the game. Going into 1959, an African-American had been named the NL's most valuable player in eight of the previous 10 seasons. Fittingly, Jackie would be the first to be honored with the award in 49, and Campy would follow his lead by winning three of them. Campanella out to Homer into the left field seat, his second in as many days. When Roy Campanella was at the top of his game, I don't think there was ever 
a better catcher in baseball history. Roy said that you had to have a little, little boy in you to, to play Major League Baseball. I never saw him a day when he said, oh man, I'm tired, I wish we didn't have two today. He said, we're gonna play two today, man. He said, I used to play three in the Negro League. Led by Robinson's intensity and Campy's enthusiasm, the Dodgers won a World Series and five pennants in an eight-year span. Also home to other great players like Duke Snyder, Carl Ferrillo, Gil Hodges, Pee Wee Reese, and Don Newcomb, the Brooklyn Dodgers became one of the most fabled teams in American sports history. The Dodgers win, and that's the pennant! What made the Dodgers so unique was that they were considered one of the people as well as baseball royalty. Known as Dem Bums, and later as the Boys of Summer. All the fans, they were part of the game. And they loved, they loved their Dodgers, and they loved Ebbets Field. I remember talking once to Pee Wee Reese, the Dodgers' longtime captain. And uh, he talked about how he would take the subway to Ebbets Field. And he'd get out and he'd go by shopkeepers and people selling meat and restaurateurs and they'd be saying, hey Pee Wee, go get him. How you doing, Cap? you get to the ballpark and he said it was like going into a bar. How you doing, Ben? What's up tonight? And he said there was that intimacy. Everybody knew one another. Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Dodgers, the bums were the core. We were the core of that, that whole borough. And what we did in that borough branched out and we touched other, other areas of the country and of the world, in fact. And uh, it, it, was, it was an institution. At the heart of this cultural phenomenon was Jackie Robinson. And in 1956, he would lead the Dodgers to the sixth pennant of his career. It would also be his last. With Robinson's retirement, Brooklyn was losing a hero. But after the next season, they would lose something more. Roy Campanella would have his career tragically cut short in a car accident. Campy's um, accident stunned the whole team when we found out he was actually paralyzed. We didn't say a word. We just couldn't speak. Before they could get over the loss of their two great heroes, the borough of Brooklyn would lose their entire team as the Dodgers announced they were moving to Los Angeles for the 1958 season. For Brooklyn fans, the pain would be both immediate and long-lasting. When it came out that uh, we were moving to L.A., oh my God, they went up in arms. They couldn't believe it, could not believe it. It was like losing a loved one. By 59, there were two teams on the West Coast, an exodus that had occurred a year earlier when the Dodgers had moved to L.A. Meanwhile, their old New York rivals, the Giants, had settled in San Francisco. The Gala Parade down Market Street bids the Giants welcome. Despite playing in Seals Stadium, a minor league park, the Giants were enthusiastically supported. At that time, they were filled up every, every game, and they were obviously a sensation. And the biggest reason for that was their sensational center fielder, Willie Mays. Willie Mays, without a doubt, was the greatest player that ever lived. You're Willie Mays. You hit, you run, you beat. Say hey, Willie. Willie the Wonder. Amazing Mays. He just loved the game. He loved the game. There's a long drive to deep, deep center field. Along with his great ability was the fact that he, he just seemed to be having a time of his life out there. Baseball is like walking in the park sometime. You go out and you look up in the sky and you say to yourself, boy, this is a beautiful day. Baseball to me was that way. With Mays leading the way, the move west seemed to invigorate the Giants and they had a winning season in 58 and got off to a strong start in 59 as well. But for the Dodgers, the transition wasn't nearly as smooth. Well, there isn't much sentiment in baseball, but you're leaving Brooklyn and you're going to Los Angeles. Will it matter to you, really? I, I can't say how I'm gonna like LA because we haven't been there yet. 
But uh, I think my main concern is to have a good ball club, uh, and uh, things are pretty nice wherever you go if you can win. But for the Dodgers, it wasn't going to be that simple. Winning was something they had taken for granted for over a decade, but this was a new time and a new place. Campy's now gone, Jackie's gone. Uh, moving from our friendly confines of Ebbets Field to the glitz of Hollywood and the West Coast, and that, was, that was a pretty big move for us. The Dodgers now played their games in the Los Angeles Coliseum, a converted football stadium. Its unusual shape, and especially its distant right field fence, made many of the Dodgers unhappy with their new home. I remember Duke Snyder used to complain all the time because he had a lot of balls that would run out of Ebbets Field that they caught there. The right center field fence was about 455 feet. That's, that's a long way to hit a baseball. And the pitchers suffered with a left field fence that was too short. You know how far it was to left field? 251 feet. I know I looked up and before I could say Jackie Robinson, uh, I was 0 6. And I thought, man, I said, I just won 17 games in Brooklyn the year before. And uh, I said, what in the world is going on? More than just the team's location had changed, these Dodgers were no longer the fabled boys of summer. Uh, Duke, Pee Wee, or Hodges, we basically had all had our best years behind us by the time we moved to LA. For a team that had grown used to success, the 58 season was a rude shock as the Dodgers finished next to last, their worst record in 14 years. And as they began the 1959 season, the Dodgers were in need of some inspiration. They would receive it in an unlikely source, their former catcher Roy Campanella. On May 7th, the Dodgers held a tribute for Campy. It was an exhibition game against the Yankees to raise money for his medical bills. A record 93,000 people attended. All of the lights will be turned out. They told everybody, we want each one of you to light one match. What a sight that was. The amazing thing is, Roy never played one inning in Los Angeles. And yet, somehow, that fandom in California caught the spirit of Roy Campanella. It was powerful. The fans of Los Angeles had reached out to the Dodgers, and now it was time for the Dodgers to return the favor. It, it meant a lot. It was something that, you know, we got to do. We got to win for people in LA. We came out here and they expected us to, to, to win, and we've got to show the fans that we're still a good ball club. As the 1959 season got underway, the New York Yankees fully expected to win their fifth straight American League pennant. The Yankees were loaded with superstars and future Hall of Famers like three-time MVP Yogi Berra, mound whiz Whitey Ford, and triple crown winner Mickey Mantle. Mantle hit the high five. In crucial situations, the powerful and talent-laden Yankees were always able to break the hearts of the American League's top contenders. Going into 1959, the Chicago White Sox had a winning record for eight consecutive seasons and had still failed to overtake New York. It always seemed, and my father would tell me this all the time, and my uncles, it always seemed like the Sox would be within maybe two or three games. They'd have a big four-game series. The Yankees would come into town in Old Comiskey Park. You can get 50,000 fans per game, and this would be at the big series against the Yankees. And then they'd lose three out of four of the Yanks, and they'd be done. The frustration of getting beaten by the Yankees was hard for Chicago to deal with. But as far as losing was concerned, that was something the White Sox fans were used to. It had been 40 years since the Sox had last won the pennant, and that pennant was certainly not one to be proud of. 
In 1919, the American League champion White Sox lost a tainted World Series to the Cincinnati Reds, and that team would live in baseball infamy as the Black Sox. We have guys who actually threw the World Series. They actually gave it away. If any team should have been cursed by the baseball gods, of course it should have been the Chicago White Sox. Whether it be karma or coincidence, the White Sox would suffer long and hard. 30 years of faltering attendance, 30 years of watching the Cubs steal their thunder, 30 years of becoming a has-been in baseball. But in 59, the White Sox were ready to change their fortune. The Chicago team hasn't won a pennant since 1919. How do you think Chicago will do this year? Well, Cliff, we think that uh, we have a fine chance of overcoming the Yankees. You really think you can win a pennant this year if you get a few breaks here and there? Yes. Our skipper predicted that we're going we're gonna to win this year. And all the guys started thinking, hey, you know, we can go ahead and go all the way. We can do things. And as the season began, it seemed as if the White Sox optimism was well-founded. And the biggest reason for that was the spirited play of their best players, in particular, second baseman Nellie Fox. Every winning team has a leader or a spark and Fox lit the fuse for the Chicago club. He was a little pepper pot, a left-hand hitter, almost never struck out. Little Foxy has a double and two singles today. I think Whitey Ford said in, in 12 years, struck out Fox one time, and he thinks the umpire blew the call. And Fox's partner on the infield, shortstop Louis Aparicio, was turning heads with his spectacular play. This is the truth. Once in a while, I'm playing center field and I should be doing something, but I'd stand there in awe of a play that Louie made. Aparicio teamed with Fox to become the league's best double play combination. And as the team's leadoff hitter, little Louie also ignited the offense with his quick bat and quick feet. Louie, you do many things well, but I think a lot of the folks come out to uh, see you get the jump on the pitcher and get those stolen bases. He stole 56 bases, which was a, a groundbreaking number in Major League Baseball. He really brought the stolen base back into the game. Aparicio set the tone for, hey, this is what a leadoff hitter should be. Together, Aparicio and Fox perfected the art of small ball. Louis getting a single, somehow got the second, now he got a ground ball to get him a third, and I'd hit a fly ball. That's how we scored a lot of runs. But it wasn't just Aparicio and Fox, as the White Sox of 59 were getting contributions up and down the lineup. They had a speedy center fielder, Jim Landis. They had a guy named Jungle Jim Rivera, who used to dive head first into bases. They were dubbed the Go-Go Sox, known for their fearlessness on the base paths and their airtight defense. But this season, they would feature an additional weapon, a true ace. They had traded for early win the season before, but he had pitched poorly and looked even worse. The pitchers were doing sprints in the outfield as they do, and early win was not happy about it. He looked like he was about 45 and grizzled and uh, big pot belly, and um, he looked completely over being an athlete. But this season, Wynn would return to vintage form and bring the White Sox staff a new toughness. Early Wynn was a great competitor. If a person uh, took too good a toe hold or hit a ball through the middle, uh, he'd probably go down the next pitch. He was a hard-nosed player. Like he said before to many reporters, he would knock his grandmother down just to win a game. And he was that kind of a pitcher. Chicago had gotten off to good starts before, but this season felt different as new owner Bill Veck made every game a big event, from exploding scoreboards to circus animals to aliens on the infield. It was clear that for the Go-Go Sox in Comiskey Park in 1959, anything was possible, even a pennant. L.A. manager Walter Alston had a daunting challenge when it came to the 59 Dodgers. He wanted to recapture their place at the top of the National League, but the team was at a crossroads, and it was his job to show them the way. He was charged with sort of rebuilding the Dodgers when some of their great players were winding down and the new wave of, of youngsters uh, was coming up. 
In many ways, Alston was ideally suited for the job in 59. Walter Alston was quiet, he was patient, he knew baseball probably as well as anybody. But the thing about him, I believe, was that he could bring the ball club together. He didn't say a whole lot. He didn't give many speeches. He just, but when he did say something, you would listen. I thought he was a fair man, very strong man. You didn't want to mess with him. Under Alston's guidance, young flamethrowers Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale started pitching with more poise while aging icons Duke Snyder and Gil Hodges reached back for some vintage performances. Alston even got former All-Star Carl Ferrillo to accept a bench role and inserted Wally Moon, which would pay enormous dividends. Wally Moon, Wally Moon, yeah, he took advantage of that screen in left field like, no, like nobody else. Anytime he hit that screen, off the wall or over the wall, they called it a moonshot. The Dodgers played far better than they had the season before, but they still could not seem to find the spark they needed to reach the top of the standings. Ultimately, a shortstop named Maury Wills and a pitcher named Larry Sherry would push them into contention. Both players had been languishing in the minors and had forged a special bond. I was going so bad. And I just made, made a mistake, made an error in the opposition running all over the bases. And I actually left the field, went in the clubhouse, was ripping my uniform off. I was quitting. And Larry Sherry happened to see me and came in and grabbed me, pinned me up against the wall, and said, you can't do that. I won't let you do it. Larry Sherry saved my career. The two friends were called up in mid-season and began contributing right away. Sherry as the team's top reliever and Wills as its new spark plug. He started getting hits. He hit balls up the middle, ground balls to the left side. Every now and then a line drive. I said, how wonderful. I mean, this guy had struggled all this time and now he's got that hitting down right. He covered a lot of ground at shortstop. I mean, you go to his left, go deep in the hole a lot. He can run like a deer. The new Dodger shortstop wheels a lifesaver for the Dodgers. With his speed, he created a, a different atmosphere when he got on base. He changed the whole club. Wills beat opposing teams with his legs, and Sherry beat them with his iron will. Anytime you talk to Larry, nah, don't worry about it. I can take care of it. Larry had determination. Larry had a, a belly full of guts. Larry was out there to beat you. And he had a slider that would hit that outside corner and you swung the ball in there anymore. He would come in and just shut the other team down in crucial moments. The patchwork Dodgers were suddenly serious pennant contenders, but they didn't scare anyone. They were not a statistically overwhelming group especially when compared to their rivals. In San Francisco, Willie Mays was having another standout season. While Orlando Cepeda, the 1958 Rookie of the Year, was showing no signs of a sophomore slump, and the 1959 Rookie of the Year, Willie McCovey, made sure no one pitched around them. Willie scared every pitcher he faced. I mean, when he go to that plate, he scared everybody. McCovey's emergence gave the Giants the league's most feared trio. It must have been frightening because I, I, you can go through uh, history and not see three better hitters at, at the same time, three Hall of Famers in a row. But still, when it came to overall talent, no National League team could stack up against the Milwaukee Braves. We had won the pennant in 57, we had won it in 58, uh, the expectations were very high for our club. We were the team to beat. Loaded with perennial all-stars and future Hall of Famers, the Braves were a powerhouse. On the mound, they boasted the league's two best big game pitchers in Lou Burdett and Warren Spahn. Burdett had earned his reputation by beating the Yankees three times in the 57 series, while Spahn would win more games than any left-hander in history. He could handle adversity, he could handle men getting on base, and he would still bow his neck and do well. You know, Burdett was the same way. In 59, Burdett and Spawn were on top of their games as they led the league in innings pitched, complete games, shutouts, and wins. 
and when they were off their game, they could usually depend on the potent Braves offense, led by the devastating duo of Hank Aaron and Eddie Matthews. Matthews led the league in home runs in 59. What a suck! One of the longest we've seen. While Aaron finished third in round trippers and first in batting average, as he once again displayed his overall brilliance. Everything looks so easy that people overlook him. But he was a, as good as anybody. He was a very fine base runner, a very fine fielder. But his hat never flew off. And he didn't have the charisma uh, that Mays did. But so steady, so solid, so strong, so good. He was probably, for most of his career, you know, one of the superstars that pretty much went unknown. In many ways, Aaron's quiet excellence mirrored that of his often overlooked Braves. And never was that more evident than on May 26th, when Harvey Haddock's of the Pittsburgh Pirates grabbed the baseball spotlight by pitching 12 perfect innings against Milwaukee. Haddock's got the headlines, but Braves pitcher Burdett threw a 12-hit shutout, and Milwaukee won the game in 13 innings. A little bit better after put, uh, putting on that kind of a performance, I'm sure. Well, the performance don't count you know, for you know, the team like this. Uh, we lost the ball game, and of course, you can't feel too good about it. I really felt bad for Harvey losing the ball game because it, it, it has been and all, probably always will be the greatest game ever pitched in the history of baseball. But um, I, I felt bad about it, but I got what I wanted was a win. As the National League race came down the stretch, the Dodgers and Giants were prepared to give the Braves a run for their money. But if Harvey Haddix couldn't beat Milwaukee after pitching 12 perfect innings, it didn't seem likely that anyone else could either. The 1959 season would not bring a pennant for the Chicago Cubs, for they were once again mired in mediocrity. But they did have one bright spot, the play of their superstar shortstop, Ernie Banks. I was just ready to play, ready to compete, ready to help the Cubs win. In 59, Banks would hit 45 homers and lead the league in RBIs with 143, while becoming the first National Leaguer to win back-to-back -back MVPs. To win the MVP award, it's a really amazing thing. I say that to myself. And on a team that finished fifth. While the north side of Chicago was home to a one-man wrecking crew, on the south side, the light-hitting White Sox were having success with a team-oriented approach, winning with pitching and defense. When you know you're not going to get more than maybe three runs in a ball game, you are bearing down with every single pitch. And that is exactly what they did, as pitchers Bob Shaw, Billy Pierce, and Early Wynn helped the Sox lead the league in ERA. And with Fox and Aparicio driving their opponents crazy, Chicago won a league-high 35 one-run games. And the go-go Sox are on their way. And the fans at Comiskey Park just couldn't get enough. They would holler, chant, go, 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 and you know, you get 50,000 people screaming, go, 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 go. I mean, it, it, you, you got your adrenaline going. White Sox, White Sox, go, go, White Sox. Let's go, 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 White Sox. We're with you all the way. You're always in there fighting and you do your best. We're glad to have you out here in the Middle West. We're gonna root, 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 White Sox. And cheer you on to victory. Let's go, 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 White Sox. Chicago's proud of you. Way out. White Sox, White Sox. Go, go, White Sox. Let's go, 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 White Sox. Spurred on by Avaricio, the Go Go Sox were the only team in the majors to steal over 100 bases. And little Louie finished second in the MVP voting. The player who finished first had the fewest strikeouts in the league and was Aparicio's partner in crime, Nellie Fox. While early win at age 39 would lead the major leagues in wins and capture the Cy Young Award. In past years, the White Sox may have been worried about being caught by the powerful Yankees, but this season, 
they were simply too fast to catch. As Chicago finished ahead of New York and second place Cleveland. It's a great thing for us to beat the Yankees. We, it's nice that we beat Cleveland uh, was to come in second, but to beat the Yankees was number one. And finally, the Sox ended 40 years of futility when they captured the American League pennant. Well, set off a raucous celebration that stretched from Cleveland to Chicago. And when we landed, around 50,000 people at Midway Airport were all over the place, and this is 2 o'clock in the morning. It was wild. You know, it's something that, you know, it'll never leave your mind. Uh, my God, there's tons of people. Having all those people at the airport made us feel great, and uh, it's, it's something that, obviously, I will never forget. The Go-Go Sox were riding high and getting ready for the World Series. But in the National League, the question remained whether the Dodgers or the Giants were good enough to dethrone the Braves. In the final days of the 1959 season, the Braves, Giants, and Dodgers were locked in a three-team race for the National League crown. For the Giants and Dodgers, fighting for the pennant was a familiar feeling. In 1951, a late season giant charge helped them catch the stunned Dodgers and led to a climactic playoff game and a pennant winning home run by the Giants' Bobby Thompson. But the Dodgers, a heated rivalry, had now turned bitter. I think the 51 playoffs not only stayed with the players who were on the 51 team, but I think the Dodgers being a very tight organization, I think they all heard the stories of the 51 playoff and even the players who weren't there carried that albatross on their shoulders. The Giants, you know, better there than the Giants. If I saw Willie Mays on the freeway, you know, broken down, I'd probably have to say, sorry, Willie, <laughs> you're a Giant, you gotta call Triple A. But the 59 Dodgers managed to get a measure of revenge on their old rivals as the pesky Maury Wills led them to a crucial September sweep. Maury Wills lays down a perfect squeeze butt to score Hodges. The Dodgers go on to defeat San Francisco 8-4. The Giants were done. But the Dodger euphoria was short-lived as the Braves beat the Phillies on the last day of the season to force a playoff. A playoff few thought the Dodgers would survive. Milwaukee was so good that year that, uh, and they'd won a couple of years before in the National League, and, and, and everybody thought, well, this is the team to beat. We were actually happy to, to, to end up in a tie because we matched up well with the Dodgers. We were very confident, and we fully expected to win the playoffs. But as they readied for the best of three series, the Dodgers were undaunted. The Braves had a better team than we had, man for man, if you wanted to match them on paper. But um, we always knew the game is one on the field, not on paper. We went there to win. That's what was our attitude. We went, there to win. we went there to win. And as the first game began, the Braves took an early lead. The Braves break the scoring ice. And then Dodger manager Walter Alston acted quickly, making the boldest of moves. He brought in his ace reliever, Larry Sherry, in the second inning. Well, he's the boss. <laughs> he's gonna pick whoever he wants, and he knows Larry wants to come in. And Larry wants to pitch. Sherry made Austin's gamble pay off as he completely shut the Braves down. He knew he could do it. And he wanted to do it, and he did it. And then Johnny Roseboro homered, and the Dodgers ended up with an improbable 3-2 victory. But back in Los Angeles for the second game, the Braves showed their championship pedigree as they knocked out Don Drysdale and took a 5-2 lead into the ninth inning. And with the unflappable Luber dead on the mound, the game seemed over. But then, like an echo from the past, the old boys of summer roared to life 
Snyder, and Hodges delivered key hits, knocking Burdett out of the game, and Ferrillo tied it with a sacrifice fly. Gil Hodges comes in with a tying run, and the Dodgers are anything but dead. We just got some momentum at the end. I don't know, we just uh, reached back and got some of that Dodger pride. And then, with the score tied in the 12th, they reached back one more time. Paul Perillo up again. Tension on every pitch. Perillo grounds the ball past second. Felix Mantilla snares it, but his throw bounces past first base. And Hodges starts home with the run that wins the pennant from the Dodgers. had no business beating them, but we did. But this has the feel of Dodgers winning a pennant again. But, uh, it always feels wonderful to win a pennant. I think this has a little bit special uh, feeling for the boys because uh, we were counted out of it many times because we were getting too old and everything. But I think that the experience came through and uh, showed the people that we're still the, the old pro. As the 1959 World Series got set to open on the south side of Chicago, for the first time in 40 years, there was a feeling of joyful anticipation. For Southsiders, the Black Sox scandal was a distant memory, and even the Dodgers players couldn't help having a sense of wonder at being on the big stage. When you're in the minor leagues for eight and a half years and you come in and get in that World Series your first year, you'd, I, I really didn't even realize how fantastic a, a thing it was. Seeing the police escorting all the banners up, and, the crowds, just the, the glamour of it all. The White Sox player least likely to be overwhelmed with the enormity of the moment was their ace early win. He controlled the Dodger offense from the start, while the favorite White Sox pounded Los Angeles starter Roger Craig. Ironically, it would be Ted Klazuski, a power-hitting late-season pickup and the least go-go of all the Sox, who would lead the onslaught. Big Clues, two homers and five RBIs, keyed an 11-0 route. Now they're standing and yelling at Comiskey Park, and Klazuski is their boy right now. They win the first game 11-0, so I'm sure the whole city thought, this is going to be it. We're finally going to lift that curse of the 1919 Black Sox. White Sox fans would have been far less optimistic if they had listened to the Dodgers' post-game conversations. I'll never forget what Don Zimmer said we got on the bus coming back. You know, we were all kind of tired and, and we'd lost the first game. And Zimmer said, go, go, Sox, my butt. Game two started well enough for the go, go, Sox as they took a 2-0 first inning lead. But the resilient Dodgers were just getting started as they came roaring back behind second baseman Charlie Neal's two home runs. But it's Al Smith and not Shaw who takes the shower. You remember the picture where the, the, the fan knocks the beer over and Al Smith, all that beer, hits him on the head. Well, I gave up that pitch. Neil's second homer gave L.A. the lead, and Larry Sherry closed out the Sox to tie the series at one. The Dodgers had come back from a decisive setback in the opener. Sherry protected a Padres victory. The series would now shift to L.A., during the season, the Dodgers were the only team to draw over two million people, and now record crowds would stream into the Coliseum to urge their heroes on. There's 92,000 people there, and, and I was in awe of what was happening. I mean, it was so exciting, you had to pinch yourself a little. The most people I ever played before in the minor leagues was something like five, 6,000 people. That was huge. You haven't played before 90-some thousand, you didn't even want to look up. The Dodgers and White Sox treated the huge crowd to a tense and hard-fought game. Carl Ferrillo's two-run single had given the Dodgers a late lead. When Don Drysdale tired in the eighth, Walter Alston once again gave the ball to Larry Sherry. With the bases loaded and the White Sox trailing by two, Sherry was again at his best. Three men lead away. The wind-up in comes the pitch. Swung on. There's a bouncer out to short. Every time he pitched, he got into a tougher and tougher situation. I'm holding my breath, and he kept pitching good and getting guys out. And then Sherry blew away the Sox in the ninth to clinch the victory. Los Angeles wins it, and they lead in the World Series. 
The Dodgers' Game 3 victory had put the pressure squarely on the White Sox for Game 4. And they would respond by trying to run their way back into the series. Vex said that the Dodgers don't have any catching. They can't throw out at Mauricio. But Vec would find out that Roseboro was the National League's best at throwing out runners. He stopped the Go-Go Sox in their tracks by nailing three of the five Chicago runners in the series. Roseboro took care of that. With the score tied at four in the eighth inning, one big hit would make the difference. This is a titanic ball game. It's building up. Like Ferrillo in game three, it would be another one of the fabled boys of summer, Gil Hodges, who would come through. Hodges' home run would seal game four for L.A. and put them one win away from a championship. Trailing three games to one, Chicago was on the brink of elimination. But in game five, they would respond in true go-go Sox fashion and squeak out a win. Returning to Chicago for the sixth game, Sox manager Al Lopez chose to gamble by starting his A's early win on only two days rest. He said early win was the guy I wanted out there. He said, if there's a game I have to win, it's going to be early win. But Duke Snyder, another charter member of the Boys of Summer, stepped up and ruined Lopez's plan. it had seemed as if the Dodgers veterans had run out of time. With Snyder's blast, they had proved again that they were not done, adding to Dodger lore. It's Snyder's 11th World Series home run, second place behind Babe Ruth. The Dodgers now had the lead, but the White Sox staged a desperate rally behind another Klazuski home run. And the White Sox have two more. But like Al Lopez, Dodger manager Walter Alston was also not afraid to make a bold move. He brought in his red-hot reliever Larry Sherry to close out the game with more than five innings left to play. Once again, Sherry would reward Alston's faith. I think Sherry was the key difference of, the, of, the, of that World Series. Just everything he did was right. With two wins and two saves, Sherry earned the series MVP and a place in history with one of the World Series' greatest performances. I said, my God, I can't believe this is my little brother. I was so proud of him. The players form around Larry Sherry, outstanding hero of the series. The Dodgers had proved to be far more resilient than anyone had given them credit for. And by completing one of the most memorable playoff runs in baseball history, the boys of summer had earned one last moment in the sun. The decade of the 50s had been a time of great stability on and off the field. The 60s would bring explosive change across the country. But baseball would continue to provide a welcome oasis of continuity. Just like the 50s, the role of the National League's premier team would fall to the Dodgers, who were only just beginning to win in Los Angeles. They would capture three pennants and two World Series in the 60s. The Dodgers win 2-1 to one and sweep the series in four straight. All Bedlam breaks loose on the field. In 1962, they would leave the much maligned Coliseum and move to Dodger Stadium. This beautiful ballpark would become an iconic baseball venue that the Dodgers still call home today. As for World Series hero Larry Sherry, he had pulled off one of the game's great championship performances, but he would never match his postseason accomplishments. His teammate, Maury Wills, however, was only getting started. He would steal over 100 bases in the 1962 season and become the catalyst for two more world championship teams. A player who once thought he was going to be a career minor leaguer, he would even win the Most Valuable Player Award in 1962, beating out his giant rival, Willie Mays. Well, I won the MVP when Willie felt that he should have had it. He's still telling me about that. And I'm saying, Willie, that's been too long now. you got to get over it. The Braves' run as a powerhouse was at an end. 
They would take many years to reclaim World Series glory and would never do so in Milwaukee. The team would move to Atlanta in 1966 and would not win a championship until 1995. And in the American League, the Yankees would not take long to regroup. They would win the next five pennants and return to their position of American League preeminence. But for Chicago, it wasn't going to be that easy. In 1959, they had come closer to winning a World Series than any other Sox team since the 1919 Black Sox. It was a glorious run, but it would prove to be fleeting. The Sox would not get back to the series for 46 years. But this time, Chicago would finally have its long-awaited celebration. A White Sox winner and a world championship! The White Sox have won the World Series! Enjoy the celebration, Chicago. This is long overdue. Baseball fans everywhere will never get over the remarkable stories that came out of the 1959 season. And those who were a part of it will always cherish their place in baseball lore.